Good evening, everybody. My name is Ronaldo Offerman. I am joined by John Young of the Disc Hello. Jockey News and the super cool, awesome high five, Gino Soto. Hey, what's going on? What's up, guys? Guys, today we hey. have a, we have an absolutely incredible broadcast for you. We are going to talk about promoting yourself. And anytime that you get a DJ saying, oh, I can promote myself, it's usually a lot of horse wash. You know, we want to know, can they really do it? And the reason I really wanted to bring Gino in is, you know, he's a, I've known Gino for a long time. He's a friend. He's one of my DJs. But what I've seen this man do, I have not seen any other DJ do. So that's kind of what we're going to share about you uh, or share about you, Gino. And Gino's going to tell you guys as well. So uh, real quick, before we start with the questions and such, um, I kind of want to give you a quick preview just so you can see what Gino has done in just a matter of a couple of years in a nutshell. He literally went from... Never DJing before, actually. It was for a party for the Blue Man Group back when Gino used to work and I was at front of house. And it was just a karaoke party. And then him and this guy, Derek, they were doing karaoke, but what stood out is that Gino had personality on the mic. And I, you know, my friend Amanda, she was she worked there too. That's how I got that party to be in with. I'm like, yo, this guy needs to come work for me. And she's like, Yeah, he's really energetic. So you're going to see what Gino did when we first hired him and what he's doing now. Kind of, sort of. Check it out. Here we go. And guys, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, Gino can be found online uh, under DJ G Note, and then he's got his new awesome project, Fino Music, which we'll tell you about that in a little bit. Uh, Gino, obviously, again, you know, we talked about how, you know, you started just because I found you at doing karaoke, and dude, you kicked ass. Why did you take the job? I mean, you've never DJed before. I know it's a daunting thing to have just somebody come up, hey, you should come be a DJ. Why did you take the job? A um, couple things. Uh, First and foremost, I've always been a musician, um, so I'm a cellist uh, <laughs> classically. Uh, so that was always my background from day one. And then, um, you know, we've always had fun with the trending music that's that's going on today. But uh, given that opportunity is such a weird time, I was 21, I believe, at the time, uh, still going to school. And it was just like, you know what? Every, everybody's doing it. Why not? You know, and it was really cool. But the thing that was really different about it was this is more of a take of an open format. Uh, t taken in the direction of an open format more than it was like nowadays, which is a lot of DJs are very focused on maybe one genre of one type. So I had an opportunity to kind of get to know every genre in this perspective. So when we started doing weddings to private events, it wasn't just knowing your rap basis or your class, or I'm sorry, your contemporary or pop music. This is something you had to know, you know, kind of, kind of everything across the board and you had to read the crowd more. And this is something that, not a lot of DJs are trained with or are blessed with that kind of opportunity. And, um, you know, it was a cool gig as a kid, um, but I'm very happy that I took that gig because um, I, it, it really changed a lot of things uh, with what I'm doing right now. So um, I, I hope that answers your question. No, absolutely. So, I mean, I remember when you first started, you know, we brought you in for training. You obviously have never beat Mix and Day in your life. And being a musician, I imagine you kind of had that advantage that you understood some music basic theory. But... At that point, I mean, I remember it was still a job for you. You came in, you learned how to DJ, how to MC, you did your gigs, and it was good. At what point did this become more than just a job for you? When did you decide, you know what, this is what I want to do for a living? And what was the first step that you took to actually make that a full-time career? Um, it really started, uh, ironically, doing the schools because that's something that not a lot of people can do. 
and I know that sounds kind of cheesy, but it's really true because not a lot of DJs like with de- DJs that do private events or do these, and that goes reverse with it. It's vice versa as well. But mostly that that was the thing that kind of put everything in a kickstart for me was that seeing these kids' reactions and they were young, and I wasn't far from them. I was maybe four years older than them. I could relate a little bit more, and it was kind of cool. So that high energy kind of just really attracted to what I'm, to what I'm doing now. And so what really another thing that kind of changed everything really wanted me to to kind of make this more than just a part time or kind of a hobby was that um you know you when when you spend a lot of money into this gear when you really want to learn the great stuff that comes with it, not just uh you know the cheesy controls that you can get for five hundred dollars but like the real science behind this mm-hmm. and, you know the instrumentation the techniques behind you know DJing right and so that was huge for me I really got nerdy with that I did I got real nerdy with the gear um. And as that was happening, um, production kind of came into play. And that's, you know, that was a project Venice that I got into later on. But production, this is something that is very huge nowadays in this generation, in this industry as well, because anybody can be a DJ nowadays in 2016. Back then, it wasn't like that. You had a sync button, but not a lot of people knew what it could do, whatever. Nowadays, everything is a standard. It has to have one. Well, you got to be different in some houses. And so um, the only thing that kind of changed me and really put everything in kickstart like I said, was, was doing the schools and getting, you know, putting my foot in the door with production. So, you know, as a, a young teenager, as you were going to events and such as an attendee, were you kind of drawn to that and thinking, say, Hey, someday I want to be up on that stage like that, doing that stuff. Or was that just something that happened after that, those first gigs you went to? I've always had that thought, but never as a DJ, more as a classical musician. That's so I was always like, thousand. I've always wanted, I've always been on stage, not, not as far as like being in an orchestra or band. I was always on stage with one, like an auditorium right. uh, type, you know? so this was a whole different ball game. This is outside. This is on a stage with subwoofers and speakers that blow your ear. This is a whole different ball game. So once you're doing that and I was on that kind of stage with that environment, the, that, like I said, the energy is something that would just kind of took over and that, um, that was huge for me. So doing all that, put it all together for me. Cool. So let's uh, let's start talking promotion and social media because, I mean, obviously that was a big part of your success, I believe. Mm. You went from almost no Twitter followers to your, what, 35 or 50,000 um, followers? Or- no, no, no. It's 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 32,000 oh, now. 32, excuse me. <laughs> no, but no, no, but it's, you know, it is, it's, it was such a big deal. Um, it's still to a lot of people it really is, but uh it's really got it's it's not really about how many followers you have because nowadays unfortunately you can buy these things yeah you know you can buy these plays you can buy these followers and so and it's a mistake that a lot of young producers and a lot of young djs do nowadays is they get so caught up with not uh, um you know by you know not not working on their craft really and just kind of worried about the image that they give off instead and so um the thing that kind of worked it out for me really was that um I started with a premiere and a premiere was a kickstart for me as far as like reaching out to these kids. And I was huge in the social media as a, as a young 21, 22 year old. And I still kind of am too, as well to kind of keep up with them. But these kids are crazy about that back in the day. Twitter was huge. Hashtags Damn. were just, you know, getting in there. Nowadays it's kind of cooled off a bit because everybody's doing it now. Everybody's following the formula on how to promote, how to do it correctly. Because back in the day, people just kind of shot things up in the air without really having a direction with it. Nowadays it's more of a science behind it with the marketing, the promotion that you're doing. So, um, back in the day, it was great. A premiere was huge promotion for these kids. Uh, we would do these live videos. We would do these slideshows throughout the events with A premiere and Force Was Only, where it would show your, you know, your 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 user. I'm sorry, your, you know, your username, a hashtag that was being used. And kids, you'd be surprised. You know, they they use these things. They really do. It's crazy. I didn't think it would catch on, but it absolutely did. So that was huge. Well, that was absolutely huge. You did two things that, I mean, I, it came to after a while that your following became bigger than, you know, even our company. So you had a lot more people, but of course the brand you were trying to do was a nationwide brand as opposed to us just being local. But you did right. two things that I remember. That's one of the things I wanted to talk to about is one. I remember that you did something just simple as putting your name on your laptop. Like you actually had the Twitter <coughs> icon on in your screen name on the laptop. How well did yep. you think that worked for you as far as getting those organic followers? And then I remember you started posting stuff nonstop on SoundCloud. Yeah. Almost every mix you did, even when you were practicing, you were posting stuff until you actually started producing your own. So how did you get started with that? And how big of a following did you would you say you built from that? It's huge. Um, I, I, make, I practice a lot in my bedroom, believe it or not, and in my living room. I, in, um, 
you know, as guilty as charged, I would use the A Premier equipment and just kind of rock out in my living room, plug it in. It was a little louder than, than I thought, but, uh, <laughs> you know, that that's the way to do it. I practice night in and night out with music that you wouldn't begin to, you know, music without introductions, without these DJ intros, because that was kind of like, that was the only way I could learn, just buying these tunes off of, off of iTunes, because I didn't really have a membership to DJ, you know, any of these record pools back in the day. It was just like iTunes MP3s with, you know, six, eight bar intros, maybe if that. And so, you know, you just go right into it. And um, as a young DJ, you know, I didn't really use sync button a lot. So these things I had to practice in my bedroom and it sounded terrible for the first couple months. But, uh, you know, you catch on to these things. And so I would, you know, practice and I would record the progress in this. I mean, I look at the videos sometimes in my Facebook from like four or five years ago of me mixing. And I'm like, God, like, how is that? It's just <laughs> different. You know, we grow up and I'm like, God, what was I even thinking of mixing these things? But that's how you learn. And so um, I would constantly do that. Um, and uh, yeah. So, I mean, you uploaded a lot of those to SoundCloud and I think everybody mm -hmm. has until they get flagged for copyright, but you uploaded a lot of those to SoundCloud, but it's not mm -hmm. a, if you build it, they will come. You got noticed. What did you do yeah. that got you noticed? It was, it was huge because that was like around the time um, where SoundCloud, I think was at its peak before I, before now that was huge back, but that's when everybody started can on writing on SoundCloud and so it was before the Mixcloud days too now Mixcloud has kind of caught on to that but SoundCloud I, I would make these you know these these 30 minute um hour-long mixes random remixes pop that were now um and uh you know they like I said I hear them now and I'm just like whoo that's rough but putting it out there and listening you know to it and, and having these people's feedback from you know from outside and I would promote it on Instagram, like I said, back to the hashtags, back to Twitter, and, and it caught on these mixes. And, you know, you, you would play to the people, the music that they would like, the remixes, like, and it was huge. It's, you know, it was a, kind of the kickstart of EDM. So that was like the revolution of electronic music with the top 40 mixed in. And it was like a big thing. And so um, people love that kind of stuff. So promoting those kind of mixes, those radio mixes got me a lot of plays and, and, and people posted it and reposted it. And it was, it was, it was great. And that really, really helped uh, my solo career as DJ G-Note, um, just doing those EDM mixes. And, and I started that, even transitioned into doing bootlegs and mashups um, that were supported by, you know, definitely a premier colleagues of mine and even other people, DJs from other people. But, you know, doing these creative mashups and things like that, that really is what, you know, kind of kickstarted it for me. Do you know what, uh, when you were doing these different things on social media and the reach and song called and such, did you really focus at all or, or a little bit on engaging your audience? Absolutely. You yeah. That? That's the big that thing. Um, as far as is engaging the audience, a lot of people who would reach out, the problem nowadays is a lot of DJs and, and people don't really like feedback. There's no feedback to them, but I would try to respond to as much people who would comment, even if it was negative, uh, positive. It doesn't matter. It was just some sort of feedback to kind of give me a direction of where I, you know, what people thought of me. And so I would reply to almost every comment I tried on Instagram, on SoundCloud. And um, that was, you know, it was engaging because a lot of people, they, they, they take that to heart when you take the time to reply to them and they're like, Oh, this DJ actually followed me or he, you know, he replied to me, he took the time. They, they actually cared about that. And they still do. So that really was, it was a big thing too. How, how important was the follow for follow? Did you follow everybody that followed you? And did you advertise that you did? Um, I tried until, I guess, uh, Instagram and Twitter started putting these big uh, um, exceeding limit things. And there's only a certain amount that, you know, the user can follow himself before they start, like, you know, flagging it or any sort of thing like that. So I would try uh, to follow back, first and foremost, the real profiles. Um, so, cause there's a lot of advertising and promo ones that follow you and things I have no relation to, but if there were the young musicians or DJs that, you know, would message me or private message me for, for some sort of advice or something that, yeah, absolutely. I would follow back because, you know, their support, if they took the time to support me as this is, you know, some sort of local DJ, you know, what, hurt, what, what, you know, same thing if I, you know, follow him and I would hear him and give him the same critique that he would mean, you know, it was like I said, back to your engaging thing, it's just a follow for follow and. You know, as long as there's communication, and that's the thing, a lot of people with these egos don't want to do that. And it's, it's, it's tough because, you know, we can learn from each other. And so that's, that was a huge thing for me as a, as a young DJ. I mean, it was, it was a big, big thing. No, One of Bernardo's favorite things is haters on, on YouTube. <laughs> Did you run into some of that when you were trying to, because this would have been a few years back. So were you seeing it then also? Yeah, absolutely. You would get a lot of them. Um, uh, 
it, it comes with it, you know, it comes with it and it's better. If somebody's talking, at least if, if they're talking about you, then I guess you're doing something right. You know, so that's, that's, that, that's kind of the motto I went by. So I was like, Hey, he's, you know, and most of the time it was just like these, not to sound me, but it was just like these, these guys who were just like these, these DJs and they would just be so angry. And you're just like, I, you know, why, why? but some of them are like that, unfortunately, but they come and go. Right. So yeah. did you reply back to them at all? Or did you just completely ignore it? Um, yeah, I did, you know, but I would most of the time, like I kept it, I'm, I'm very short. I'd put a smiley face, a thumbs up, like, thanks, you know, some sort of feedback to know that, yeah, I did read your message and you know, I, I, I tried to stay out of that whole DJ drama business. I really do. Well, maybe we should do a seminar on that. How to stay out of DJ drama business. It's tough. A lot of them get into yeah, it. Arnaldo, you'd be great Social for that media one. doesn't help. Yeah. <laughs> and Arnaldo would be a great spokesperson. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so... <laughs> You know, it wasn't that long until then you had said that Nappy Boys had picked you up there, Nappy Boy DJ Coalition. It wasn't right. even wasn't even two years. Uh, you started DJing, and all of a sudden, I guess they had noticed you. Well, how- yeah, the Nappy Boys um, was huge. It was uh, um, I started with um, was a friend of mine, colleague who lived in FSU, and he was a friend of this DJ. Uh, and I forgot his name right now. DJ, I haven't spoken to him in years. So, um, but he, uh, DJ Nasty, I think it was, no, it wasn't DJ yeah. Nasty. DJ Nasty was from Orlando. Forgot the name of his job. He's still spinning on Nappy Boys, but he uh, reached out to me from SoundCloud. Um, and uh, he heard one of my mixes and rap was huge, uh, not EDM. And so they wanted to make that slow transition to rap and EDM. So they, you know, I helped with some things and some promotion and they got me a couple gigs. Well, I remember, yeah, I remember on the roster page that they actually had pushed the fact that you, can spin EDM, and at that point, that was your unique selling point because there weren't a lot of uh, rap and EDM DJs. Did you see, because you were one of the first ones really pushing that and pushing the merging of the two, did you really see that as a good, unique selling point for you, or was it something else that got you noticed? Are you there? I think we froze. I think, yep, I think we froze. Hold on. All right, those of you watching, just hang on one second while we get him back in. This is live TV, gang, and this is what happens when we're live. Oh, he's in Colorado or Denver, so there's a good chance the cell phone company's just high right now. Um, yeah, yep. hold on. He can, he'll bounce back in. So, Arnaldo, can we talk about what you talked about last night just a little bit while we're waiting for Gino to bounce back? Yeah, absolutely. So last night we did a video stream uh, talking a little bit about – uh, Apple and what the heck is going on with them? You know, I mean, what what they're doing is they're getting really away from that pro level stuff and going into, you know, making the world's most powerful Facebook machine. So I was there with Dane, you know, who's an IT admin, oh, yeah. yep. uh, and also Kevin Hallmark, who is a programmer, and he's been programming on Apple for over twenty plus years. Uh, so we'll actually be doing a part two of that really soon. And I'm really hoping we're going to have somebody from Apple. I can't say whom, but we're kind of hoping that, you know, that'll play through. And uh, I mean, it, it went very well. Honestly, I think it was one of the smoother live streams. This one would have been really smooth, but it looks like Gino got disconnected. So, yeah, we were doing we were doing pretty well. We had a good connection. He was he had a few little glitches, but nothing major. But yeah, let's see here. Hang on one second. Let's see if he's Gino. Where did you go? Question in. mark. Gino. I think his phone died. Or something. Oh yeah, yeah. If his uh, if his battery died, that could have been. Oh, that's so awkward. There, we we we'll we'll get some. <laughs> We've got something going on. Oh, there he is, Gino. Can't hear you. Cannot hear you. Can't hear you. All right. Can you guys hear there, me? There, there we, we go. go. Yep. Okay. So. So sorry, guys. Hey, right, no, no problem. problem. No problem. So we were talking about, you know, the Nappy Boys uh, on the roster page, and I was trying to see if – are you still on that by any chance? I'm on the roster page still. Yeah, I'm on their um, roster page. We still we still talk, but I talk more with this gentleman named Nav. He's this promoter from Boston, and he's a, he's a pretty good colleague of mine. Um, but that's really it. That That's all we really – we just talk gigs and here and there. But uh, I'm not really affiliated with Nappy Boys anymore like I used to be. Uh, I'm really not. So, I mean, when they brought you in, I remember they had pushed the whole, you know, you are an EDM DJ. I mean, mm-hmm. would you say at, at that point EDM was still kind of, you know, on the baby stages of becoming a big thing? Would you say that EDM was your unique selling point? Did you actually push the fact that you were you were able to do literally two polar genres? Because at that point, if you went to a hip hop club, you would never be playing EDM and vice versa. 
Uh, yeah, it was that's that, definitely what, what was that something you would say would have been your selling point? Did you push that or did that part come in by accident? It kind of it kind of came to me and I pushed it. It felt it, it's what people like the most coming from me, I guess. I got the best feedback from that more than anything. Uh, definitely more than, than I would like the hip hop or the reggaeton stuff. When, when I was kind of pushing more of the EDM stuff, they, they I got way more uh, positive feedback from that. And so I pushed that as hard as I possibly could. <laughs> awesome. So then let's talk. I mean, after that, you obviously got picked up or you actually started working with a group doing EDM music. And I'm actually, I'm going to kind of jump forward on that part for a couple of reasons. But as far as you working with that group, and I, you know, you can give us as much info as you want on that. How did that come about? Did you approach them? Did they approach you? And how did you balance? Um, how did you balance from being just a DJ to being a producer, but not turning into David Guetta? And not right. making your no, music. I was still a <laughs> producer at that point when we started Venice. Um, that was just uh, this was a project we we initiated uh, a couple years ago. Uh, I want to say 2013, I believe now. Um, and so uh, it was with a friend of mine. His name was Alex, and um, it was just uh, kind of two friends who really wanted to, to start an EDM thing. And that was really where EDM was really starting to kick in and make headlines because uh, following the next year was one of the world's biggest uh, ultra festivals um, and EDC festivals. It broke records and, and attendance festival records. So we got started right in the nick of things. We got started right, right where we were. So Gina, we you're, you're making, breaking, you're breaking up real quick. You're breaking up just a little bit. It's like hanging up. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's better now. Sorry. Go ahead. So sorry. Uh, and so, um, yeah, so I started this project uh, with Venice, and um, we started. I, that's when I got into production the most. Um, that's when I started really getting heavy into production and kind of laying off more of the DJing. And so we started releasing original mixes, and that is, is really what stood far from most uh, DJs, is because original music is on a different kind of scale than, than than mashups or bootlegs, because it's more it's your own, it's your own kind of your own animal. So. Would you say, as far as just being your, you know, traditional DJ, going to parties, rocking the house, playing other people's music, did you get a chance to incorporate for those private gigs? Did you get a chance to incorporate some of your own music? And was there a different feel as far as how you were able to hype up the crowd because of that? And vice versa, when you were at these big club gigs, did you hype up on the crowd like you would at a private event, which normally isn't done at these type of clubs? It's different. It it really depends on the crowd. Um, it depends on the feedback of the crowd, you know, if it's something that they uh, want to, you know, private events. I've had private events more crazier than some club events. Um, and I'm talking weddings, I'm talking kids and arrows that I did. You know, I've seen those kind of get very high. And um, you just kind of, you have to roll with, what, with what's given to you. And, what's, and um, there's, I would push original, I wouldn't really push original music uh, private events as much as that was, um, I know it was something that I felt like it was. You're, you're breaking up again. You're breaking up was, again. You're breaking up again. Hello. There we go. Hello. Okay, that's better. Hey. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. So, Sorry about that. So, um, I really didn't push original music too much in, uh, in private events as much as I would club events just because it was just the appropriate setting, uh, you know, the event. that. But I did definitely, you know, I would do it at some school events, uh, uh, some, um, you know, different events as well. But, uh, but yeah. So, Gino, uh, oh. just a second, Arnoldo. Uh, Gino, during this time when you were doing the producing and such, you have this classical music background that, that that's where you came from. Yep. How did that, did you tie that in as far as what, did that help you in the production area? Huge. It was huge. It was definitely in a, um, boy, I would say, because a lot of DJs now and producers, even back then, a lot of programs would kind of do all the science behind for them. And so it, although it would sound good to these producers, they don't know what they were necessarily doing. They, they, they probably couldn't explain to you that, you know, this is a one chord going to a five chord resolving to the, they, they probably couldn't explain that to you as much as a, someone like, like, you know, classical musician, because um, back then when I started learning, there really wasn't these kind of programs that would kind of fill in the blank type chords for you. Nowadays, these, there's just a lot of these MacBook, these Apple, you know, these Apple apps and programs, they'll do all the work for you, put in a D note and they'll build like a seventh chord off of that. And um, back then that really wasn't like that. So it was huge for me, um, learning, you know, having that theory, that music theory behind me to really help out with these programs. Um, so it was, it was definitely uh, 10 steps ahead of most uh, you know, to get, to get started. Cool. So, I mean, uh, 
when you were, you know, once you actually got to that point where you were doing the clubs and everything else, I mean, you bra- brag a little bit. Tell us, you know, I mean, where did you get a chance to go playing? I remember you had like gigs pretty much all over the world. It came to a point that I knew I was going to lose one of my good DJs. So where all did you get to go play? Gino, you're getting just, dis- uh, you're breaking my- up again. Hello? Hello? Hang on a sec. Hey, you got me? Uh, you're a little frozen, but that's better. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, my first big event uh, was actually outside of Florida. It was Utah. It was Das Energy 2014 uh, festival, and we won that uh, from voting, from just uh, uh, click on this link and go vote for our mix, and let's hope that it wins first place. And that's it, it certainly did. Um, promoted the heck out of that on uh, Instagram. Um, and, uh, and, and Twitter and, and people, you know, there's genuine people out there that really would take the time to do it. And so that was our huge event that we did in Utah. I did a uh, DOS energy there. Um, I did some shows in LA, uh, this club called create night club. I did, um, another one in, um, San Diego. Um, I did Amsterdam, of course, as Arnaldo knows, I was gone for most of the summer last year yep. uh, for about three months. Um, I did a couple of gigs, um, in Amsterdam. I played in London, um, Ministry of Sound, uh, uh, which is a kind of like a techno tech house, is very underground um, venue. Uh, but uh, and then I I did uh, believe it or not, I did the Gay Parade in Amsterdam, which was huge because a lot of DJs play there, um, and it's like house music all day long. It's it's really that's that's it, house music all day, and these Europeans love their house music. So it was kind of it was I learned a lot about music and different types of house music doing these different events because you can't you can't play the same set as you would in like LA or, or Orlando as you would in like you know Canada or Europe because you have to read these crowds these crowds don't always like me yeah, they like they like techno you know so it's it's very different but uh but yeah I hope now I hope that answers your question I played some real cool places um, um all around so when you're these like for example you know Amsterdam like you just said they're obviously mm-hmm. going to be a completely different crowd than here and I imagine playing at a different country for the first time ever has to be nerve wracking. Did mm-hmm. you already have your set pre-planned or did you literally mix, mix a lot of it live or change anything on the spot, seeing how the crowd reacted to different things? I never had a pre-planned mix, but I will admit that I had playlists that would help me um, kind of, uh, you know, it was like your go-to playlist, right? Or your, you know, your playlist for this sort of genre. But the thing about that, and I wish I could get better, it was organizing the files within the playlist. Because mm-hmm. sometimes I would just kind of dump them in there. But, um, you know, I would never pre-plan the set. And that's something I'm kind of not, I'm not, I'm not pro for. A lot of DJs do that. They kind of plan their stuff because you can't, not every crowd is the same. And not every crowd is going to like what you drop. And if you put a song on and you have, you you had it planned to play out for three minutes, but the first 15 seconds, you have people booing at you. You know, you got you got to change gears quick. Oh, and a lot of you don't know how to do that. They don't know how to act on instinct sometimes. So I never really tried, you know, pre-planning it. Um, but uh, I try to stay. I try to stay away from that. Point. And I try to tell other young DJs to just to don't do that either. You know, focus more what's in front of you, and if the people are vibing with that, then more of looking down on the laptop and figure out what you're. So. Do you see that a lot of other DJs in the same, you know, DJs or producers in the same level that you're at, are they doing the same or are they, I mean, obviously we know like the big guys pretty much have one track hit play and that's it for the most part. Mm-hmm. But do you see that a lot of people that are actually traveling that are actually doing the clubs that they do the same thing or they already have that pre-made playlist ready to go? I think a lot of people are starting to catch on to you have to be, you have to do your own thing. You got to be creative in it. So um, a lot of DJs, unfortunately, are following the same formula, the same type of music, EDM music, the same type of uh, quote unquote big room or or electro. A lot of them stick to that. But uh, what I really like now, especially in the year 2016, I saw it really grow was these DJs. Um, they played every genre They you know, you'd go to a main stage and any sort of festival or you'd go to any sort of event club event. It wasn't just 128 BPM. It was 101. You'd even hear some 70s, and they would mix in. Some of them weren't always the best transitions, but they would kind of, you know, at least you weren't always pumping your fist, you know, raising your hands to just 128. So um, it, I'm starting to see a lot more people adapt. But um, back in the day, a lot of them pre-planned. I know a lot of people who, who probably did that, and it was, was kind of stunned. 
So let's go back to the voting thing. I, 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 I had completely forgotten, honestly, about Utah, but I do remember that when you had brought that up and you were posting, you were mm-hmm. posting just nonstop, hey, vote for us, vote <laughs> for us. And obviously, I mean, you know, enough people voted for you that you made it. Would this go back because you did interact back with the people on Twitter or was that something else that actually brought that many voters? Because you had an insane amount of people voting just out of nowhere. It was, it's not even that. It's a, it, Anybody can like a picture, but when people would comment and they would say, you know, I voted for you or something like that, a lot of people just kind of skip to that. I would even reply and be like, thank you. And there was at least – there was a time uh, when, I, when I won the festival – they had I posted that I was like thank you guys so much for taking the time out of it there was like 50 comments of saying I voted for what I spent like an hour and a half responding to these people by one by one by one by one yeah. because you know what I mean this is something that really meant a lot to me and I did the same thing on previous posts the ones that I would kind of advertise a little bit you know kind of these guys vote for me because it just really meant a lot that somebody who I didn't even know or somebody would tell them you know vote for my friend Gino he really wanted it really meant you know, two minutes, you know, to, to just do that. So the least I could do is just say thank you so much for you taking the time. And they would even hear the mix or the song that was on there, and they would compliment even on that too. And and I, that you know, like I said, what little is it for me to just take two seconds out of my day and just you know reply to that? And so that that goes a long way. It really does. Do your fans know that it's actually you versus a marketing company that's behind your Twitter? And how do you keep yeah, reassuring like, them like that like it's I'm actually not, yeah. you? Um, I try to be as, I mean, I got typos sometimes that kind of prove it. So, um, <laughs> sometimes I'll, you know, I'll put, you know, abbreviations or different faces and things to kind of stand out that because there's a lot of, like I said, services like bots that kind of do these things for, you. Yeah. um, and it's, it's like, thanks, you know, it's a very player to that. And so I got at least kind of, well, you're breaking up again, Gino, you're breaking up again. Hello. Hello. Hey. Okay, there we go. Hello. Yep, you're good. Hey, go ahead. So, so, like I said, I would just try to keep it unique in that perspective and, and put a little, you know, little flavor instead of just being so plain and just saying thanks, you know, because a lot of people are like, ah, yeah. So, yeah. No, for sure. So, now let's talk about, I guess, from the business side of it. Uh, I mean, I remember you had a manager. It came to the point that I even had a check with you and you had a check with your manager before you could do a gig for me. Yeah. So, at what point did you decide we really need a manager? Was it because when you were with Venice, was it before Venice? And how important has a manager and a, you know, or the manager, your PR, pretty much that team, how important has it been for you? And how did you choose the right manager? Um, the, the thing, the picking point when I got a manager. Oh, Gino, you're breaking up. Hold on. You're breaking up again. You're breaking up again. Hello. No, you're breaking up really bad. Wherever you just went, it's breaking up. Nah, I'm still here. Yeah, just give it a few seconds. It'll clear. Yeah. Okay. Let's try that again. Go ahead. So, hey there. Um, um, well, really, I, I got a manager. Um, honestly, when the emails kind of became a little overwhelming and, I, and, I, and it became to a field where I didn't really know what I wanted to approach it in a way that was a little bit more professional and more experienced than what I would have done. So there was a lot of like – um promoters and a lot of these different type of services and, and, and people who would reach out to us uh, regarding interviews, radio interviews, podcasts, and things that we want to do. And I didn't know really how to go about that. And I didn't want to go about it the wrong way. And so I would hire, you know, I, I hired my best friend um, at the time. He, uh, he was a very good friend of mine. He um, was very experienced in that. He handled a lot of interactions uh, with very, very important people. And he, he, he was very good at that. So, and I, like I said, he was, very good friend of mine and so i i, I asked him and i kind of told him I was like hey you know, it's just, it's just oh, you're, you're breaking up again the, you're bre- the donut. you're breaking up again hey hello okay there we go that's a little better so um yeah i, I pretty much said uh that um it was it was a project that i told him to kind of go into i was like hey like this isn't going to be something that i can promise you that you know we're going to be in vegas next year you know headlining this big club this is something that takes time and so um, he, once he agreed with that, it was, it was kind of a go for us. And so, um, once it became overwhelming for me and unfamiliar, unfamiliarized with some of the things that I didn't know and how to approach them, that's when I kind of made the call and got a manager for that. So 
you know, I, I know that one of the horror stories every time we've done anything related to this kind of uh, topic, people talk about mm-hmm. janky promoters. You know, some clubs have amazing promoters. Some of them have the absolute worst promoters. Uh, have you dealt with these janky promoters and how do you deal with it? How do you make sure that you get paid when you're supposed to get paid, that your writer is met and that they follow their end of the deal? Uh, first things first, get it in writing. Um, a lot of people nowadays have a sense of trust uh, where this is like shake my hand and everything's going to go. But a lot of promoters and it's not even the music industry. Um, it's in any industry. Just protect yourself. So um, and there's a lot of people who kind of just enter for the money. And there was a lot of bars that I used to do when I first started DJing um, where it was just kind of like depends on what the bar makes. And then that's what you get. And it was tough because uh, there was a lot of times where I would DJ for like four hours and have like thirty dollars to show for it. And so um, it was kind of, it, it stunk. So learn through that, but definitely get it in writing so you don't get yourself in trouble and, and, and the promoter is, uh, you know, doesn't screw you. So on a marketing uh, standpoint, I remember this was something that, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. I, you and I had gone multiple times with this with our DJs about being open format that, you know, it's to me, I always thought that was one of the most important things a DJ can be. How important would you say being open format has been not just to your style, but to you being able to market yourself to different clubs and different venues around the world? It's huge. It's huge because a lot of, like I said before, a lot of things just one specific genre. Um, they just know, and then that's it. And then they get thrown in oldies from the eighties and they feel very uncomfortable because they just don't know. So having this open format, doing these weddings and quinceañeras and all these things, it, it brought a lot of perspective into a lot of things because um, there's many genres that a lot of them don't know. Don't, they don't know about. Nope, um, you're, you're, you're breaking up again, Gino. You're breaking up really bad. Let me see if I can get a better spot, guys. Okay, if not, me- uh, disable your video, and that might help a little bit too. But Yeah, then we'll just have audio. Yep, that might help. All right, give me a sec. If so, I have photos of you we can just put instead. <laughs> No, that's okay. I'm just trying to maneuver. All right, right, right where you're at. Side. No, right where you're at. It shows a full signal. That's good here. Right, yeah, wherever you just did. Yeah, you've got a full signal now. Okay. Well, you did. Now it's not there. You okay? No, nope. I can't. You're break. You're not. Like, hello. All right. This is okay. All right, are you there? I'm here now. Okay. Cool. Okay, so we we're, were talking about open format. Um, real quick, is I mean, obviously, you know, when you're playing a, a weddings, so you're playing 80s and Frank Sinatra and all that. And I mean, obviously, like you just said, being open format is important for this kind of career, but is, it, is being that open format, would you say that you playing 80s music at a wedding, would, did that actually help you out in your career now as a club DJ, as a headline opener, that kind of stuff? Yeah, absolutely, because there's a lot of people who still listen to that stuff. There's a lot of people who still listen to that, and you'd be surprised. The young kids nowadays, even in schools, and, and Arnaldo, Arnaldo can vouch for this too, uh, these kids know these these bangers from the 90s and the, 90s and the early 2000s. So this good music really never dies. And so um, these young kids know Aretha Franklin. They'll know some old school stuff. And so if you slowly kind of transition or merge that in to like an EDM type thing or trendy pop music, they're all about that. They are. They are. So they'll, they'll, it's very good to have that perspective and that backbone. Gene, when you when you were performing and such, and you were being able to do that more of an open format at times where it was other working with other DJs who were doing one genre, were you taking any or looked down upon because you weren't you know true to the genre that they wanted you to be playing or or what they were playing for the night? Was there any of that going on? No, nah, not as much. No, not really. They would ask a lot of questions. Um, and uh, a lot of them would be nosy, like, hey, you know, what, what are you playing? What is that? You know, what is that? But never, you know, we really bump heads. But um, it was, it was, it was cool because it would go back and forth with me too. Because it, there was stuff that they would play that I would know about, and like I said, I would like to bounce off. We bounce ideas back and forth cool. between us. So, so uh, for those of you guys that you know really want to see what Gino can do, especially at a mobile event, if you go to like fourschoolsonly.com and search Gino G Note. Uh, you'll actually see some of his videos. And the thing that has made Gino famous, you know, within our company, within our schools, is this guy is a fireball of energy. Pitbull has nothing on Gino when it comes to jumping on a stage. I'm telling you, this guy's crazy with his energy. 
how do you translate that to, you know, like when you're, when you're doing stuff, uh, you know, like for example, we'll talk EDC in a couple of minutes, but when you did stuff like that, do you get on the mic and hype them up like that? Cause you know, when you go to those kind of festivals, you don't see the DJ get on the mic as much as just like say like a hip hop DJ, but you seem to balance the both. How do you do that at the big festivals? And have you had somebody tell you, Oh, don't get on the microphone or do you do your thing anyways? There are times, yeah, but um, I have kind of you to thank for that. Um, I have uh, you to kind of Arnaldo training when I was just, just like I said, a small DJ, and I was very, very nervous, uh, public speaking, super nervous. And um, Arnaldo was like, in order for you to do these events to get paid, oh, you're breaking up. Do you know? Hold on. Do you know you're you're breaking up right after you said nervous? Hold on. All right. Can you? Hold on. I'm Guys, go just in case you know, uh, don't know, Denver does not have a reputation for the world's best cell phone service. It's because everybody at it's T-Mobile not. is getting high right now. Hold on here. <laughs> I'm going to go back outside. Uh, while Gino gets situated, guys, if you have any questions, of course, make sure to submit that in. We've already got a couple of questions in, and we'll kind of go that in just a few. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, no worries, man. There we are. All right, so hyping at the festivals. We were just talking about that, and you said that you got nervous at public, public speaking, and then it cut off. Well, uh, like I said, I was nervous when I first started, but uh, training with Arnaldo was was kind of a huge thing because I wasn't known for public speaking. I never was interested in doing it. It was just something that I just I was terrified of doing because I just I would just kind of get I would just get all caught up and just kind of freeze. And so Arnaldo was like, "Hey." In order for you to get paid, I'm going to need you to do this public speaking so I can book you for these events. And I was like, all right, well, we'll learn. So I did these trainings with Arnaldo and um, another colleague of mine and, and Arnaldo's colleague, uh, Kelly, and they helped me out to, to kind of get, you know, I was like a hermit crab. I really was. And so um, they got me out of my shell and uh, it took a bit. But um, once you kind of learn your own routine, and something that, because you don't have to follow what every DJ is doing. Everybody can kind of yell their own one, two, three jump. But uh, Arnaldo trained a lot of, you know, young DJs like myself, different ways to approach that. There's not, there's different things you can say on the mic, not just scream and sound like a clown. So um, there's been events where in, in, in the past where you can't even get on the mic. They have an MC of their own and that's it. But a lot of DJs nowadays, unfortunately, they, they don't know how to MC and it kind of stinks because they just yell into a mic and, and they just they, they don't really know how to read a crowd and half the time they got the levels wrong and it sounds like a mess when they got the speakers going on. So, you know, these are things that uh, these people, these, I feel like a DJ should learn about because MCing is very important still in 2016. It's just as important as it was 20 years ago. Absolutely. And I, th I think a lot of DJs have lost track of that. So mm -hmm. let's, uh, let's forward to, I mean, my, this is my favorite part that I always brag about you to my schools. EDC, you played EDC and I remember you almost turned that down because, you know, you wanted to protect your brand, but how did EDC happen? And what year was that? First of all, um, EDC was, uh, 2015, okay. um, in Orlando, EDC Orlando. Um, and we played on the neon stage, uh, which is known excuse me, as a tra uh, trance stage. Because at that time, that's what I was uh, producing full-time was trance. And uh, EDC was kind of a blessing because we started releasing major releases on, on these labels in Europe, uh, Ava Recordings, um, which is a, a sub-genre of this bigger um, recordings called uh, uh, Black Hole Recordings, which is a record, uh, sorry, label that was founded by uh, our very own Tiesto. And so uh, that was huge for us. And so getting these, these tracks out, we had about three songs um, released on this label and um, that got us booked uh, for EDC a lot of recognition a lot of the SoundCloud a lot of this you know the Spotify it caught on and so um, we just we got I just remember it was funny because uh, the way that I found out about EDC was through a phone call to my friend and he was kind of like joking he's like hey we're gonna play EDC and I was like oh boy I don't think we're gonna play it I don't think we're gonna play it and then sure enough uh, you know we, we got an email from Insomniac inviting us to play and it was probably one of the greatest days of my life. But uh, it just, it was, it was really, guys, it was just grinding it really and just getting tracks out and being and getting them on these labels. And, and a lot of people listen to these things. And, and that's what really caught on kind of standing out and being different. So, so as far as, you know, you and Venice, I mean, obviously, you know, you guys separated. There was an article mm -hmm. that I remember was out 
uh, you know, that you basically decided to go your own way. You had some creative differences, whatever it was. But the toughest thing about, you know, going out after you've been with a company for so long is reestablishing your brand and having that conversion rate to your new project. So how many of your fans would you say still stayed with the DJ G note brand, even though they knew you more as part of Venice as opposed to G note individually. And how did you keep that conversion rate going? Um, believe it or not, a lot of them, a lot of them stayed, uh, a lot of them, I guess you could say stayed faithful. It wasn't, it wasn't anything, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? It wasn't anything, no negativity. There was no dispute really that was crazy between Venice that really caused anybody to kind of choose sides. It really wasn't. And that's something that I'm kind of happy about. We kind of went our both separate ways because it's tough. And I respect, I have the utmost respect for these producers and DJs who have these teams of like Swedish house mafia is a perfect example three brilliant producers, you know, they all can't get along all sometimes, you know, same things happen. It's not a matter of getting along as far as, you know, uh, personalities. It's just getting along as far as music direction. You know, do you want to play, do you want to have this sort of sound here and there? So um, I wanted to kind of do my, my own sound and production. And so uh, people understood that. Um, I did an interview uh, with EDM Chicago is about a week later as, as I announced my departure from Venice. And, um, you know, as I stated there, I've had a lot of ideas that I've had in the past since college when I wrote music on you know, sheet music before I even got into the whole doll programs. Um, this is music that I kind of had in my little Pandora's box and I kind of want to open it up and try my own thing there. So um, that was something that, that a lot of people understood and they heard. And it, it, it kind of was nice. A lot of people heard the interview, gave a tons of feedback to it. Uh, posted on Instagram, like I said, those things. And, and a lot of people were very understanding of it. And a lot of them still talk to me still to this day on, on Fino. So what did you use to keep it, keep in touch with your fans as you made that transition away and going solo again? Um, social connected? media, social media is huge. That's, Specifically that's, what, which, which ones were you using at the time? Oh boy. Uh, at the time I would say Twitter was, was, was huge. Twitter, Instagram were kind of on the same peak as me. Facebook really wasn't as much. Uh, Facebook was more of like a personal thing. Um, uh, but even a lot of my personal fans, um, personal friends and family, uh, I would announce it there. And a lot of people, a lot of people commented and, and went, was just like, Hey, we just hope for the best. You know, it was, I hope everything works out for you. And they're still supporting. I still see the same people commenting on, on the productions that I'm doing now. And I really read that, you know, Snapchat was big as well. That was more of like a direct type of personable thing uh, with Snapchat. So I would kind of interact with, you know, mostly Snapchat, uh, Instagram and Twitter to kind of make uh, these, uh, I guess you could say these announcements and these, um, you know, these, these, these feedback that, that I would give to people and they would give back to me. Right now, which is the social media network that you would say you use or you put more, more of your focus on? It's tough, man. I, got, I use them all almost the same, but if I had to pick one, um, as a DJ, I use it mostly, uh, for Twitter, but as a producer, I use SoundCloud more, if that makes sense, yeah. because a lot more producers listen to SoundCloud and you'd be surprised a lot more producers listen to SoundCloud and give their feedback on young producers, upcoming producers, you know, most of the time it's good feedback and construction of feedback. Uh, but that's more, like I said, that's kind of like a little nerdy, a lot of, a lot of people. And unfortunately SoundCloud has started a plan, like a 999 plan. And, and it kind of has killed a little bit of the streaming options for, for SoundCloud. Uh, but still, a lot of people reach out on SoundCloud and listen to your, your stuff there. But um, that, like I said, DJing and, and producing, it, it's its own it's its own thing. But mostly all of them, for the most part, mostly all of them. Not LinkedIn. I didn't. I never used LinkedIn. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, never got into that for that. So now you're working with Fino. Uh, tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about Fino. You know, what's, what's the vision that you have for it as far as, you know, the style of music that you're going for it? And what are we going to see from Fino? Fino is an awesome, exciting project that I started back in July. Um, it is a project that I'm doing with a really good call, Fiona Swanson and uh, her brother, uh, Travis Swanson. Um, they've been friends of mine for a very long time. Fiona is a very big DJ here in Orlando. Um, not here in Orlando, I'm in Denver now, but over there in Orlando, uh, she's very, very big locally. Um, she was, uh, she's been DJing and she comes from a reggae background, which is kind of cool. She is a very different type of touch into uh, the production that I'm doing now. And it's huge because I'm learning new things. And so she, like I said, she's a big local DJ in Orlando. She just uh, moved to Paris uh, maybe about eight months ago. Mm -hmm. And she's DJing out there and she's doing kind of her own thing there. And then I reached out to her and I was like, hey, you know, let's chase this dream. You know, let's, uh, I'm, I'm very, I got some ideas. What do you think about this? We, you know, we got on a phone call. 
and she was all about it. And, you know, this is, I spoke about it with Travis too. He's a very, very good friend of mine as well. He lives kind of close to me back in Orlando. And, um, we kind of talked about guys, you know, what, what are we going to do? What direction, what are we going to do to make, to be different and to stand out? And, um, we all kind of bounced ideas with reggae. And then, you know, what about, what about like bass? And then it's like, what about future bass? And then future bass kind of stuck. And I was like, guys, I got an idea. Let me, let me get in the studio. And I kind of made, I, like I said, I come from a trance background. So trance and future bass have zero similarities. Completely zero. So this was new to so, me. So I was trying new sounds. What is future bass? Future bass is a very, it's a very simple, <clears throat> sorry, simple, um, melodic structured, almost like the reason I'll get the future bass to me is, is a very, is a trendy jazz and like R&B feel to it. But future bass right now is just more probably the most simplistic music you ever hear in your whole life because it's kind of more percussion and like the, about 90% of the, of the song. And then the drop is maybe like three or four chords and that's it. And maybe like a simple melody on top. There's not really too much that goes on to it as a listener, as a producer, it's very different. It's very hard for most producers because it's these chords that really knock people out of you know, these ninth chords, these 11 chords. Those are very complex things that feature bass is brought into. And so that's when you kind of get into this nerdy stuff with production and LFOing and using different types of, uh, you know, gates and reverbs and types like this to kind of play with the production. So like I said, production right now is very, it's a very exciting time for producers right now because unfortunately live instrumentation is kind of being taken away from music. Production is cranking up with these new samples and these new sounds that we've never heard before in our whole life. And so future bass is a perfect example of that, you know, Flume is probably the innovator of this and listen to his stuff. His stuff is wacky. It's completely wacky, but it's brilliant. It's like sounds of pots and pans and, you know, a couple, a couple different filters and a couple different, you know, way you EQ some things. And it doesn't even sound like a pan anymore. It sounds like something <laughs> completely different and, it sound, and it's incredible. It's, it's, it's just incredible what, what it is. So future bass, like I said, you know, back to it, it's the most simplistic thing and it's, it's taking it to a whole new level. And it's very sub, very subby, very bass heavy, not, uh, not like bass heavy, like dubstep, but more like a melodic bass heavy. So so yeah, that's to me. Like I said, that's the way that I like to explain in future bass to kind of give an understanding to most to most listeners. So I mean, it's it's obvious from what we've all heard so far that part of what really helped you blow up is you were on top of the trend and you you know you stuck it out, you kept pushing it, and you know you really stayed on top of that. So mm -hmm. that being said, you know I mean, there's a lot of talk amongst all DJs. What's happening to EDM? Is it going to be a trend? Is it evolving? I mean, it's obviously been evolving since the '90s, but what would you say is the next thing in EDM? Like, what's the future? What are we going to see from EDM, the genre in general? I think we're going to probably see the word EDM disappear because EDM has now changed into about 40 different, 25 to 40 different subgenres. Future bass, uh, electro, um, big room. There's so many. And listeners nowadays are starting to catch on to that. They're starting to differentiate these different types of EDM. So now when you go up to somebody who's been to like maybe one or two festivals and you're like, man, this I'm into EDM music, they'll probably look at you kind of strange. You're like, oh, I don't really like that word EDM. So I feel like EDM right now is going to be so uh, cut up in a different type of genres. And now production, as you hear on the radio, 90% of it is EDM. Chainsmokers is the perfect example of it. They don't really like using the term EDM, but it's pop music. Pop music is EDM. And so um, it's it's going to blow up if it not if it hasn't already, you know, so it's going to become the focus of what we hear on the radio for the most part. Wouldn't be surprised if Sam Smith jumps on a track and does <laughs> some crazy, you know, EDM song. It's 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 big, you know. So. All right. So we got a couple of questions that have come in. Um, the first one is and this was kind of actually one that was uh, that I was going to ask, too. So they, I like how they phrased it better. As far as a DJ and a performer, what would you say is the main quality that makes you stand out? You know, what, what made you stand out above other DJs on that stage? A um, couple things. Um, first things first, you got to learn how to mix because a lot of DJs nowadays are starting to catch on with these equipments and just kind of plug and play the song. As soon as the song ends, they press play. Learn how to transition very easily because people listen. You got a lot of listeners out there. You got a lot of young DJs out there who are learning and they're not as silly as they look. They might know. So first and foremost, learn on your, you know, work on your craft and make sure you're, make sure you're doing your job first. Make sure you're DJing correctly. And then, you know, emceeing, being a little different with your MC skills, you know, be, be creative with those. 
uh, be creative with your trend with your with your songs that you choose don't always choose the same songs that people choose you choose maybe a different remix or a variation of it or a way to intro you know introduce and nowadays a lot of djs are using these dj controllers that have these cue pads that have cue buttons on there you can start at any moment they have up to like eight starts and you can start on a track i use that a ton when i you know when i do some events that that let me use controllers that already have them in the club set up why because you can set up cue points all over the song and be so creative with it and you can transition so easily into these things using these cue points so you know try try to be very different with it take take it to a whole another level you know so so hope that works awesome uh second question that came in uh i don't know if you i don't think you're i don't know if you're a tractor user or not but have you played with stems stems uh is stems a program stems okay so basically on it's a tractor thing i, I you're a serato guy but basically stems allow you to do live remix on the fly so let me rephrase the question for them mm. kind of sort of do you do a lot of like live production you know have you done where you especially no, serato, not like yet. the bridge not yet okay not yet no so what's uh, and this one comes from Joshua. What is the digital audio workstation that you are using? Currently, right now, it's 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 my baby. It's it's Ableton. It really is. Uh, I used FL Studio for about three years, and I learned the basics of production. And um, it was you know the song format and things like that. When I jumped into Ableton, which was in July, I kind of locked myself in a bedroom and learned everything about the program. And um, Ableton was the best because you can do live programming, you can do live DJing, um, live production, live remixing, all in that one. Now, I'm not saying that I do the live remixes on, on performances, but that's something that I would love to kind of tickle the you know the the um, the idea of it, you know. But um, definitely, Ableton is home for me. It will it's going to be my future home. I love it so much, and it's definitely the best thing that's that's happened to a lot of producers. And a lot of producers use it, you know. A lot of producers will tell you that Ableton's the best thing, but it's not a matter, and this is something that I want a lot of young producers and DJs to know too. It's not what program you use; it's how you use it. Amen. You know, and that's a big yeah. thing. It's not what program. You know, FL Studios looks like a it looks like a color book to me. It's so full of colors, and there's screens everywhere. It's like it's crazy, but you can make some amazing stuff in FL Studio. It's how you use it, and so these kids are like, "Well, these presets, can you put?" Don't don't learn the shortcuts. Learn how to do it. Learn how to do it, and you and you will never regret it. I promise you. Absolutely. You know, there's a couple of things you've said, uh, words you've used over and over again throughout the, our little time together. As you've used uh, practice, yeah, and learning that you're learning new things. You learn. We're learning young, and you're and, and still today. How much time do you dedicate to the area of practice and learning new things within your craft on a weekly basis? Um, you know, I don't really have a, a timetable on that. When I was a kid, I've always I was kind of a nerd about practicing. My my parents are. I'm thankful for my parents for doing that. I hated practicing uh, cello when I was a kid. So I kind of stuck to maybe an hour a day. I'm not saying that every kid should jump in and, you know, and do that an hour a day, but definitely um, turn off your phones and turn off any sort of distractions that you would have. Maybe 15 to 20 minutes is better than having an hour of distractions and having that. You know what I mean? It's not a matter of how much time you put in, it's what you put in. And so um, when I'm practicing, when I'm reading something, because I read a lot of, you know, a lot of nerdy books that have kind of helped me out. I just kind of zone out. I turn over everything off and kind of dedicate to that, even if it's like 15, 20 minutes. But I learned more, like I said, in those 15, 20 minutes than I did an hour of just kind of rewinding something or reading it again or doing it again. It's it's just a matter of what you put in. So I would say, you know, 30 minutes a day is great. If you can do a little bit more, then that's great too. But make sure you're in the right environment to do it as well. Make sure you, you know, you're relaxed, you're good, you're focused on it because that's what really matters as well as well, what, what you put in, what you get out of it. Absolutely. And again, guys, as we get ready to wrap it up, if you have any questions, either if you're watching my channel or John Young's channel, put your questions in now. Uh, another one that came in also from uh, Joshua DJ JD. Uh, what are some of your favorite VST plugins? VST plugins, my babies are uh, um, Silent uh, and Serum, um, Massive, and that's really it. But primarily Silent, I'm more of an analog kind of guy now. Um, analog is the type of synth that you use now. And um, it's, it's, I'm more of an analog kind of guy now, but nowadays a lot of DJs and the sounds that you can make now in Serum, it's like, uh, it's like a $200 program and you can do probably any and every sound in that guy. So like I said, and that's the same thing with that. It's not really a matter of what VST you use, but how you use it. But the big, big popular ones are Silent and Serum. With those two guys, you really can kind of do anything and everything. Massive as well. Massive is huge as well. So. Um, actually there was a question I wanted to go over earlier when we were talking about branding. So, uh, mm -hmm. 
But those of you guys that don't know, as far as on the four schools only side of things, I'm a huge control freak as to what my DJs do, what they say, right down to what they wear. And I always had to make exceptions with Gino, including the beanie hat that he always wears at every event. But, you know, remember that Gino, that's one of the things he said, look, it's part of my branding. You know, something as simple as a beanie hat. How important would you say little details like that really made towards your branding you know, is that something that the people who noticed you by? I mean, how did that work out for you? Well, um, a little secret is the reason I wear this beanie is uh, honestly when, you know, trying to hide the balding that's happening as uh, the older we get. Uh, and yeah. Unfortunately, I'm 26 <laughs> years old and I'm telling you, I'm already hitting it young. But, you know, I I, uh, it's, it's, I caught on to it. I, I've been wearing beanies for a bit and it's just kind of who I am. I'm wearing it now because I'm freezing about 30 degree weather, but. Um, it's just an image thing and it's something that I've always, it's kind of who I am. It's who I've been. I wear hats too. It's not always beanies. I wear a lot of, a lot of fitted hats too, but, um, it's all about image and branding. Look at DJ snake. You show me a picture where he's not wearing dark sunglasses. I'll, yep. give, I'll give you a hundred dollars, you know? So it's all about people who remember you by a specific thing because people have short-term memory nowadays. They really do. They have a lot of short-term. I do. I have short-term memory all the time, you know? So they got to remember you by something. And so um, if it wasn't by my logo, maybe it would be something else. So I'm not saying everybody should do it, but find something, you know. Absolutely. Uh, cool. John, do you have any more questions or is there anything else coming in from your channel? Sir? Um, no, I think they've just been uh, commenting, just uh, kind of having a running commentary. I don't see any questions on this side here from that. Awesome. Uh, Gino, anything else that you would like to tell any aspiring producers or more importantly, uh, DJs that, you know, want to make it big. What's the one piece of advice you would tell them to help them really break out into that, uh, channel? Um, I've, as far as everything that I've said, you know, I hope you guys take that with a grain of salt. Um, but there's, there's always room to learn. There really is. I'm learning a lot every day. Um, I have these adults that come to me that ask me these, these questions as well. These old producers and old DJs. There's always room for improvement. There's always much to learn. We live in a generation right now where YouTube is at our fingertips and we can learn anything on YouTube and everything. Um, and so, you know, always learn, always, always look out to find new ways to do things because, well, I mean, it's fun, you know, it's fun to learn. So, you know, that's, that's what it is. Uh, actually, a question had come in earlier. Uh, it says, <laughs> did you meet Pasquale? Um, I have not met him. I've seen him, but I've not met Pasquale. I've seen him very, very close. So I believe that is all the questions. Gino, you're getting a lot of props from DJs that are really happy to hear that you actually mix. You know what I mean? It's, yep. it's a bad stigma that's going around DJs right now that none of them mix anymore. So No, that's right. And like I said, I do apologize to you guys and everybody that's viewing. Um, I know it seems kind of weird that I'm running around everywhere, but uh, I just had a flight that I know is a discombobulated flight, so... No, it's not. I'm sorry. No, no, it's it's, so, all, it's all good, man. Uh, we, we know you're busy, yeah. so I appreciate it. Yeah, so, but cool. yeah, guys, I hope I hope it was very helpful. So, and you guys know my name. If you have any questions, you know, I'm always open to help out anybody. Absolutely. And again, SoundCloud.com slash Fino Music. I'm actually going to go ahead and put that name. John, I don't know if, you, if you're able to put that on your uh, Wirecast. Uh, but it's SoundCloud.com, P-H-I-N-O-M-U-S-I-C. Uh, it's yeah. Twitter it's at DJ G N O T E and any other way they can reach you out. Are you yet on iTunes or anything like that where they can start? Uh, I your should stuff? be releasing some new music on Spotify and iTunes very, very soon. I got a lot of stuff that I've worked on in the summer. I've kept kind of quiet, uh, very lately, but I have a lot of music that I'm releasing. Keep in touch guys with the sound clouds, excuse me, the Instagrams. There's going to be some new stuff coming out and I'm going to be promoting it as much as I can on the iTunes and Spotify's of the world. So absolutely. All right, so actually, you know what? I'm sorry. There's one more that just came in. Um, and funny What's enough, up? this was actually, and then we'll wrap it up after this. And this was actually one that I kind of wanted to go over, but I thought we'd be out of time. Uh, obviously, when you were working for us, uh, you know, I made you into setting everything up too. Uh, how would you say how important, I mean, everything do you learn as far as setting up the lighting and understanding how the lighting works, how the, you know, the visuals work, especially visuals, because visuals are big now. Would you say that helped at all with your performance and being able to shape your performance around the visual aspect of the show? Or do you Absolutely. say you do your own thing regardless of the visual? Absolutely. Lights and visuals put color to, to kind of what you're doing uh, with the music. Anybody can kind of drop the music of what you're doing. Not everybody, but most people. But it really, if you learn the lighting perspective and you as a DJ, if you know like what to expect, you know, if you have blackout before the drop, you know, something like that. You know, a lot of these 
you know, a lot of young uh, visual guys or learning uh, lighting guys, you know, they don't always know that. So there's information you pick on as experience goes, but uh, Arnaldo taught me um, programs that we use with the lighting stuff. And, you know, it was essential for me because now I know how these things work and, and why they work. And um, it's crazy because it's, it's its own science as well. <laughs> that's the thing I respect any, any tech because that's its own beast. But um, it doesn't hurt, like I said, to learn about it. Just, you know, you know, put your toes in the water and just kind of learn a little bit about it. That's what I did. And, and I'm glad I did because even they use that equipment that you see is used all over the world for big stages that have Bruno Mars on it to the little ones that you see. It's all usually the same company. A DJ is a big one that, that you, is all around the world, all these things. So if you learn just a little bit about it, I promise you, you're going to see it again. Awesome. And speaking of uh, gear and all that, I, I know you're a Serato guy, but have you done record box? Do you think laptops are going away? Is that something you're going to see more record box? Doing? Believe it or not, is my, is, is probably my primary use. Is now, it really? As far as clubs. Hmm. Yeah, okay. Record box is huge. It's not my favorite thing to use, but it is. Um, record box is kind of very limited. Now you're um, talking about the record box as far as loading it on a USB stick or record box, the actual mixing software they just released. Record box is far. Well, I mean, it's essentially both. You, you, yeah. you have to load and you got to, you know, put it all in the USB and, you know, format it's kind of a pain in the butt to do but um uh and the thing about it's kind of scary because you have all of that in this little chip <laughs> so if you lose that guy <laughs> you're done and that yeah. ha that's happened to me a couple times so always have a backup plan oh that's a great advice always have a backup plan a backup library or something you never know what happened but uh you know record box is a great thing to do um but i've seen some of the cool controllers and and cdjs that they're coming out with with what they're going to do with record box and that looks like some really cool stuff but uh, I'll probably be a Serato guy at heart and obviously respect to virtual DJ because that's where I learned everything. So, you know. Absolutely. All right, guys. So thank you all so much for tuning in. We're going to be back in a few months. I, I think we talked about three months from now. Uh, yeah, yeah. Gino's going to be talking about Fino music and the next level. So once you are getting noticed, how you make it into the big leagues. Uh, so Gino, sure. thank you very much, brother. I, I, I do appreciate it. Don't forget, I still need you uh, April the 1st. Uh, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, for real, yeah. I, mean, I appreciate you tuning in. Uh, they'll see you tuning in. John Young, thank you guys very much for watching. And Thanks, again, Shopper, for also joining in, buddy. Thank you guys. Remember, soundcloud.com slash Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you.